This audio presentation was pre recorded and edited for brevity and clarity. Hello, my name is Diana Campbell, and I'm pleased to be here with you for today's Macular Chat. In honor of February's Macular Degeneration Awareness Month, today's chat topic is Macular Degenerations. <laughs> macular Degeneration, get the facts. And we've received a lot of outstanding questions from our listeners. This chat is brought to you today by Bright Focus Foundation. Macular Degeneration Research is one of our programs here at Bright Focus. We fund exceptional scientific research worldwide to defeat Alzheimer's disease, macular degeneration, and glaucoma, and we provide expert information on these heartbreaking diseases. You can find much more information on our website, www.brightfocus.org. In honor of AMD, Awareness Month, we are changing the format a little bit. Rather than having one broad topic, we're going back to all the questions we've collected from you over time and getting the answers from our guests today. We want to make sure to cover the topic of living with macular degeneration broadly, and we are excited to bring back Dr. Gayatri Riley as our speaker. Dr. Riley is a retina specialist and vitreo retinal surgeon at the Retina Group of Washington, a large practice in the Washington, D.C. area that specializes in retinal conditions such as macular degeneration. In addition to treating patients, Dr. Riley has dedicated her career to research in ophthalmology. Dr. Riley has been a primary or co-investigator for several ophthalmology, uveitis, and psychology papers. Dr. Riley has always maintained an interest in the teaching and educating of residents. She's participated in a number of medical eye missions, educating other physicians on eye examinations and performing comprehensive exams and surgeries on indigent patients, both in the United States and abroad. Dr. Riley, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me back here. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. We've received so many wonderful questions today. I've grouped them into some broader themes, and I'm going to start with some AMD basics. Um, let's get started with what is macular, age-related macular degeneration, or AMD, and could you please, in your answer, describe the difference, differences between wet AMD, dry AMD, and geographic atrophy? Sure. So age-related macular degeneration, or AMD, is an eye disease that can blur your central vision. The macula is a very specialized portion of your retina, um, and it's the most important portion for your sharp, straight-ahead vision. So anytime you're looking at somebody, having a conversation, or reading a book, you're using that portion of the retina called the macula. And AMD, um, which it comes in two main forms, a dry form and a wet form. Um, the dry form of macular degeneration uh, can start off as early and or it can be intermediate. A more advanced form of wet macular of macular degeneration is wet uh, macular degeneration or uh, dry macular degeneration with geographic atrophy. The biggest differences between uh, wet AMD, dry AMD, and geographic atrophy um, is that wet AMD is characterized by the presence of abnormal blood vessels. Now, your retina and your macula, you're supposed to have blood vessels uh, present, but when there are blood vessels where they should not be there, that's when, that's when we diagnose wet AMD. And these blood vessels can cause permanent vision loss, and that's why we uh, take it so, so seriously. Geographic atrophy is an advanced form of dry AMD where the tissue, the light-sensitive portion of your macula, begins to atrophy or become very, very thin. When they become so thin, you can develop vision loss. Thank you. Um, and we have a question from one of the listeners that asks, what causes dry AMD to turn into wet AMD? Um, so I guess the question is also, does dry AMD actually turn into wet AMD, or are they kind of separate processes in the, in the retina? It, it does um, it does progress from dry AMD to wet AMD. Thankfully, um, patients with AMD, only about 15 to 20% of 
um, patients will develop the wet form. Now, we don't know exactly what um, can cause the transformation from dry to wet, but once you develop wet, we will be seeing the presence of these abnormal blood vessels that I was talking about earlier. Um, and that is, again, what accounts for a significant portion of vision loss. If a patient has dry AMD, um, and we'll, we'll go into this a little bit more later, but outside of geographic atrophy, there aren't um, treatments outside of vitamins for dry AMD, what doctor should be monitoring their process? Um, and how, how often should one see either a retina specialist versus a regular ophthalmologist if this is the case? Um, that's a great question. Now, uh, most of the time, a regular general ophthalmologist can uh, manage dry AMD. Uh, we typically recommend um, follow-up about every six months, and most of that visit is sort of discussing what we'll talk about a little bit further in this call, things like vitamins and, and signs and symptoms to look out for um, in order to, uh, again, er detect a uh, change to wet AMD sooner. Depending on where you live, there's sort of um, a little bit of a geographic variance in, in this answer. In, in my area, in the Washington, D.C. area, there, there's just so so many retina specialists in this area that frequently patients are, are followed by retina specialists, but regular general ophthalmologists do a terrific job of managing dry AMD. Wonderful. I think that's an important point to make. Um, I know that it's difficult in some areas to find retina specialists. Um, is macular degeneration hereditary? It is, and um, I wish it was as simple as you know, you know, having one gene or something of the sort. But macular degeneration is very hereditary, and one of the first things that I'm counseling patients uh, about with this diagnosis is, you know, it's, it, we definitely want to have a family discussion regarding this diagnosis because um, it is definitely hereditary. Thank you. Um, I know that there has been confusion in some conversations that I've had um, of the difference between dry eyes and dry AMD, um, but a step beyond that, does having dry eyes contribute at all to getting macular degeneration? No. So thankfully, um, dry eyes has no increased risk um, or any sort of relationship with dry AMD. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a listener who says that they get large flashes of blue light and floaters. Are those related to macular degeneration? Those are concerning symptoms. Uh, flashes and floaters are something we'd like you to make sure you do get evaluated with either um, your general ophthalmologist or a retina specialist, but they are typically not symptoms that are related to AMD at all. Thank you. Um, if you have AMD in one eye, what are the chances your other eye will be affected? So typically, like we talked about, uh, most patients have what starts off as dry AMD, and it's typically a bilateral condition. So it's very, very um, uncommon for me to diagnose AMD in only one eye. So it is almost always um, a bilateral or involving both eyes um, at diagnosis. And I think it bears saying that um, that people could experience one form in one eye and the other form in the other eye. Is that accurate? Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, each eye can have a completely different um, course of uh, macular degeneration and different forms of macular degeneration. You can have one eye just being um, dry macular degeneration. The the other eye can can have wet macular degeneration. But typically, at least at its kind of core, uh, AMD is considered a, a bilateral or both eye condition. Great. Um, what percentage of people with AMD go completely blind? That's a, a really, really good question. Um, thankfully, um, it, it's going to be less than 1% because AMD, like I started off explaining, it impacts a very one area called your macula. 
So your entire retina is in charge of your vision, and um, AMD does not tend to impact your peripheral vision, which um, is still very, very important for um, everyday life. So patients with AMD typically do not go completely blind. Um, at its worst, and it is still very, very serious and significant, um, they can lose central vision, but they do not tend to go completely blind. That's reassuring. Um, can macular degeneration be reversed? Unfortunately, no. Um, a complete reversal of macular degeneration is not typically something that we have any um, means of achieving. However, it can be stable. So, it, you know, while it is a degenerative condition, the rate of degeneration is so, so variable per patient and even per eye. And so there, it's definitely possible that, you know, in in a 10-year period of time that there be be no change for a given patient. So it's not typically reversible in the sense of just diagnosis, but um, it doesn't necessarily need to progress quickly. Great. We just got a question in that is kind of the perfect segue um, into the next set of questions, which will be centered around diet and lifestyle. Um, the question was, what do children of AMD patients need to do to prevent AMD? Um, and the first question that I had for us is, are there dietary or lifestyle measures one can take to delay or prevent macular degeneration? Yeah, so what I usually tell um, family members of patients who have uh, a diagnosis of AMD is that the best possible things that you can do is, is really just take care of your overall health. So um, first and foremost, you know, exercise, um, you know, maintaining a healthy lifestyle is, is all very, very important. I don't recommend any supplements for patients who do not have a diagnosis of um, AMD, but I do recommend a healthy diet. And we know that green leafy vegetables um, have a lot of protective antioxidant effects on the macula. So your spinach and your kales are, are certainly helpful um, to to maintain a, a healthy diet for for your macula. Great. Um, so we mentioned vitamins earlier, um, which uh, the current formula that well you can tell me. <laughs> can you please discuss Arids too, and at what stage of macular degeneration they would provide benefit? Sure. So ARIDS-2 vitamins, um, fortunately, there was a very, very large clinical trial, both the original ARIDS vitamins and the ARIDS-2 supplements, that helped to um, slow down the progression of AMD. So it helps to decrease the risk of going from dry macular degeneration to wet macular degeneration by almost 25%. So for a collection of vitamins that is, is excellent. I only prescribe this in patients who have um, intermediate uh, dry macular degeneration. So if, uh, you're, if, you're, if your doctor has diagnosed you with dry macular degeneration, it is important to ask, ask what um, stage you have and whether you would um, benefit from taking uh, these supplements. Um, the ARIDS-2 vitamins uh, inc include vitamin C, vitamin E, copper, zinc, lutein, and zeaxanthine. The last two are antioxidants that were added um, in the ARIDS-2 supplements that have been proven to help um, decrease the, the risk of uh, wet macular degeneration. And I assume that if, um, if the patient has one eye that is already wet, but that other eye is still in the intermediate stage, that they, they would likely continue taking the ARIDS um, until the other I eye has any changes? Yes, I do. Um, I, I do recommend that they continue to take it. And I, I explain it to my patient, just like you just mentioned, is that we're really trying to decrease the risk of um, the wet macular degeneration in, in their better eye. We don't have any good proven benefits once um, a patient has more advanced forms of macular degeneration. So I do primarily um, recommend the, the vitamins for intermediate dry. And just to reiterate what you said previously, this isn't something that the children of folks who have macular degeneration should go out and start taking. It's really effective once they've um, been diagnosed with intermediate dry. 
Correct. Yes, I don't recommend any supplements prophylactically. In fact, the ARIDS-2 clinical trial actually looked at exactly that group of patients, um, patients who um, either did not have uh, a diagnosis of macular degeneration or had only early uh, dry macular degeneration, and it was found to be of no benefit. But, you know, I think that so just like any other supplement, it's a, if you have just a healthy diet, you, you can pretty much be obtaining very much of the same ingredients in just a, a very normal, um, healthy diet. Great. Um, we received lots of questions all throughout the year um, on other supplements that, uh, you know, that people have heard about from others with macular degeneration or seen about online. Um, I'll, I'll name a few, but the, the broad question is, are there any other supplements uh, that are helpful that may prevent or delay the progression? And the ones that we get questions about frequently are fish oil, omega-3s, chrysanthemum tea, um, goji berries, I think is more an actual fruit than a supplement, but I imagine they're supplements too. Are any of these helpful to prevent or delay the progression of AMD? No. So a couple of those that you had mentioned were also uh, studied in clinical trials to see if they were should be included in, in the AREDS-2 supplements, specifically um, omega-3 fatty acids, um, and it was not found to um, give additional benefit from it. They now, in general, a lot of these um, additional things that you've mentioned have other impacts that are, are positive for your body. So, um, you know, not specific to AMD um, precisely, but, you know, things like fish oils and, and omega-3s have a lot of benefit to the eye in terms of dry eye and, and other conditions, but not specific for the delay of the progression of macular degeneration. Thank you. And just a reminder to everybody listening, um, as you're taking or considering taking other supplements, please make sure to mention them to your doctor as well, as, as supplements can also interact with other things. Um, and I always get nervous when I hear people saying, I'm taking this large dose of chrysanthemum tea or something like that. Um, so please make sure to mention that um, to your primary care physician or your um, eye care specialist as well. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Along those same lines, we talk about incorporating colorful foods to our plate. You mentioned spinach and kale um, to help in protecting against AMD. One of our listeners has a pretty specific question and would like to know if it makes a difference if the vegetables are cooked or raw. Um, is there any increased benefit in cooking them, or is the benefit decreased if they're if they're cooked or overcooked? Honestly, with my patients, I'm just happy that they're taking them. <laughs> oh, that's part of their diet. You know, it, it, as long as you're fairly consistent. In general, um, cooking some vegetables, you can lose a little bit of some of the nutrients, in particular um, vitamin C and B, but um, not to an extent that it would make it not worthwhile to continue, it's just any water-soluble vitamin um, tend to get, tends to get lost during cooking uh, methods. But, um, you know, I, I usually just tell my patients that, um, you know, you can have a, a little bit of both, but really just if you're thinking about this level of detail, then you're on the right track already. I like your advice that you're that you're happy that they're they're incorporating them at all. Um, while we're on that topic, we literally just had a question about saturated fats. Um, does eating saturated fats um, harm the eye? Saturated having high levels of saturated fat um, is definitely a negative uh, for macular degeneration. Um, again, going back to one of the first questions you said about things that you know people can do about just just having being healthy um having less saturated fat um in general is is very beneficial for your overall health um which you know from what we understand of macular degeneration is also very helpful so um you know just having a high diet of saturated fat you're going to have higher levels of you know cholesterol and and um you know th those types of things in general are, are pretty negative uh for for your overall health Sure. Um, okay, we're going to transition into some other lifestyle questions. Um, how much does smoking affect AMD? 
Smoking is one of the biggest things I talk about with patients um, with AMD, and and I always kind of cringe because I know I know my patients have heard this from you know primarily every doctor that they see if they are a smoker, but smoking causes changes in the eyes that absolutely can cause to vi- cause vision loss. You're you're more than it's sort of an exponential relationship. So you're more than twice as likely to develop AMD if you're a smoker. And then on top of that, the, the prognosis and, and the, the likelihood of developing more advanced forms of AMD are, are way, way higher. So it's, you know, from my, from my perspective, it's one of the most major modifiable risk factors for AMD. And, um, you know, like I said, I always kind of this is the one thing I take the most time in talking about with patients who are smokers because I know they've heard it before and I'm sure they're doing um, what they can to quit, but this this is the one thing that really can really save your vision is if you quit smoking. I've learned to ask recently um, because of the availability of so many different types of um, smokeless <laughs> nicotine and that sort of thing. Um, is it the nicotine? I mean, should people avoid nicotine as well, or is it the tobacco um, or the effect on the lungs? Uh, is uh, just a little step further on the smoking. Sure. Um, you know, and I, I don't know that we know all of the, the details of, of breaking that all down, but we do know that um, the uh, – that having the both the nicotine and the tobacco causes a lot of infl- inflammation in our body, and it's really that inflammation that um, we worry about when it comes to macular degeneration. So, um, when you know, we, we'll talk a little bit later on in this call about um, you know where the research is, and a lot of the research is in exactly that to decrease inflammation. So, both smoking cigarettes and even you know other tobacco lists or tobacco, all of that stuff. Still is a, is still a, a high risk factor. Whether it's you know it, I, it's slightly better than you know a regular cigarette, probably, but it still causes inflammation. Absolutely. No, thanks for clarifying that. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, the next question is about alcohol. Is there a relationship um, between alcohol and AMD? Should people be looking to limit their alcohol intake as well? Um, there's been found no no significant impact to light alcohol use, and and just like everything. Else, that we we tend to counsel patients just in moderation. There's been no um, significant impact to more advanced forms of AMD. Um, you know, things out of those norm, norms, more of a moderate or heavy alcohol consumption um, does increase your risk of early AMD. So I think in moderation, um, uh, a small amount of alcohol consumption is fine. Great. Um, two late-breaking questions in that same vein before I keep going. Um, I, I, I ne- neglected to include in our original um, dialogue um, sunglasses and sun. What is the effect of sun on the eyes and relationship to AMD? The sun, that's definitely a good question. Um, exposure to sun is definitely a risk factor for um, developing AMD, and, and that's why we do see some um population differences between um Caucasians and African Americans because of also their their sensitivity their skin sensitivity to sunlight as well. So um in in general we do uh recommend just wearing um UVA UVB sunglass protection um you know when you're out in the sun you don't need anything particularly um you know, expensive like polarized and things like that. Just your regular um, UV protection is is beneficial to protect your eyes. Okay. And then the other one was poor sleep. Do poor sleep habits or insomnia, other sleep disorders, have an effect on AMD? So not directly. Um, nothing that we know would be a direct impact, but that kind of goes back to. Um, your overall health again. You know, if you have poor sleep hygiene and poor sleep habits or you have sleep apnea, all these things in general um, tend to impact your health after a while. And um, that can, you know, sort of indirectly uh, impact your, your AMD, but nothing directly. Great. Thank you. How about screen time? <laughs> does, does screen time affect um, AMD? 
Nope. Um, so screen time has a whole lot of negative um, impacts to your eyes, as unfortunately we've all probably uh, struggled with over the course of our um, lives, but um, it will not cause or worsen um, dry or wet AMD. Okay. Uh, the next question is related to cholesterol and drusen. Um, so are drusen in the eye the result of high cholesterol levels? Um, and a kind of tandem question to that is what is the cause of drusen? Um, and then following that, can lowering LDL or other cholesterol levels slow the progress of early stage dry AMD? And finally, do statins have an impact on AMD at all? Um, these are really, really good questions. Um, they've been sort of studied over the past five years. Initially, there was some suggestion that potentially high, high dose statins, which um, are in general very difficult for patients to tolerate uh, due to side effects, may have a protective role. However, um, more recent studies have shown that um, the statins have not had an impact on AMD. So I don't have a black and white answer on this. All I can sort of say is that research continues to um, look at this very question because uh, it is a rather fascinating portion of the disease. Um, Drusen, in to the first part of the question, Drusen, I, I guess I wish we knew exactly where Drusen formation came because it would be something wonderful that we could target. It is actually a normal and natural response to aging. So even if you had, um, you know, just as we get older, your, your eye does um, form Drusen. However, when you don't have AMD, the natural mechanisms in your macula are able to get rid of drusen. So they're just sort of natural byproducts that tend to be um, eliminated just by normal natural function. But in a condition like AMD, for a variety of reasons, these byproducts start to collect um, within the macula. All right, thank you. Um, so are there other medications, are there medications that affect um, either onset of AMD or um, interact, you know, regarding treatment of AMD? I know we've um, received a few questions about blood pressure medications and whether they contribute to the onset. Um, but could you just generally mention if there are medications that, that people should be aware of that interact in some way, either with onset or treatment? Um, no, not really. I mean, we do... We do kind of review all the patients' medications with them, but there's not particularly uh, medications that patients need to be wary about um, when it comes to AMD. Now, going back to the idea of just having um, your overall health uh, under good control, we do know patients, um, I always do talk about patients' blood pressure control and, and in a more positive way. So I, I want their blood pressure to be as well controlled as possible, um, whether, you know, what it's with uh, with medication um, or however they've discussed with their primary care physician. But uh, there's nothing in particular that um, I kind of look out for that might be more negative for AMD. Great. Thank you. Um, are there any corrective glasses for macular degeneration? Um, that's a question I get every day, um, so that's a really good question for sure. Um, so the best analogy, and I hope this analogy still holds for a few more years, is that your eye is very much like um, an old-school camera. So the macula is really the film of that camera, and so if you put a new lens on that camera, you, but the film is damaged, you still don't get these photos to come out. And it's the same kind of answer that corrective glasses um, really does not don't really change your your vision with macular degeneration. Now we always want your vision to be as good as possible, and that definitely involves having um, corrective glasses. But if there's damage to the macula because of macular degeneration, glasses will not be able to compensate for that. Thank you. Um, we're going to switch over into monitoring and treatment um, at this point. Um, and I'd like to start with um, geographic atrophy because in the past year, um, as, as many people on the call know, but we get a lot of questions about this, um, two, two, the first ever treatments, and there's two of them, um, were approved for geographic atrophy and they're now available. Can you please discuss um, who is a candidate for these treatments 
and what should be taken into consideration when making a decision to undergo treatment. Um, they do differ a lot from the injections, obviously, for um, wet AMD, and that's a big question, if you could kind of address that. Um, let's just start there. <clears throat> Sure. So we have been extremely excited, um, you know, at even having these these drugs available. Um, geographic atrophy is an advanced form of dry macular degeneration, where areas within the macula have um, typically gone got become very thin, become very atrophic, and no longer function. Now these these areas of thinning or atrophy can very, very slowly increase year over year. Now, thankfully, patients with geographic atrophy typically do not have a very sudden change, but um, we do see that the atrophy progresses and it can impact, again, your central vision. And now these two new medications that we have, they're both injections, um, I, they're both in, injections into the eye, similar as to how we treat wet macular degeneration, but their goal is not to um, improve the areas of atrophy, but instead to try to prevent the atrophy from getting worse. So um, that's really how these drugs are being used clinically is to, you know, unfortunately, we currently don't have any way to um, make these atrophic areas go away or completely just not develop. But these two new medications um, have been found to slow down the growth of the atrophy. So I've heard in discussions with patients, people say things um, such as, well, I tried the injections for geographic atrophy, but I didn't notice any difference, so I stopped taking them. Um, so I just wanted to, to point that out and, and highlight what you said about um, kind of slowing down progression uh, and managing expectations, I think, and understanding what the, what the treatments are for. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it, it is really different um, than any other drug that we tend to use as retina specialists, and it involves a lot of conversation. Um, and, and I don't mean this in a light way, but if my, my, my patients should not notice a difference by getting this medication. That means that the medication is actually working. So it's hard to take a medication, um, you know, when when you can't really recognize the benefit, right? But we do it for other things. You know, you don't you don't notice if your blood pressure was 140 over 80 versus 120 over 80, but we know there's so many benefits in in your blood pressure being 120 or in you know under 120 over 80. So we we do things prophylactically in that respect, and and sort of sort of the same light is that you won't um, notice an improvement um, in your vision, but we are trying. That's our goal. We're trying to prevent this atrophy from getting worse because if it does get worse, you will unfortunately notice a vision change. Thank you for that. It reminds me of the conversations about glaucoma as well. <laughs> you just have to yes. trust that you know you're something yes. for your eyes. <laughs> so much of this is really just a, a trust and an open conversation with your with your treating physician, right? Because um, you know, sometimes we take for granted that we understand that the you know, that the patients know what we're doing or why we're doing it, but every so often we're all humbled and, and we kind of recognize like let's just take a step back and, you know, let's let's talk about why we're doing this and, and you know, my expectations and your expectations. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning that doctor-patient relationship, too. That's so important um, and, and critical, I think, to, to people adhering to their treatments or understanding why they're doing them. So I appreciate that. So aside from these new um, geographic atrophy treatments, could you discuss some of the other, and I'll kind of quote unquote is how I put it, newer treatments. There have been some other innovations and um, drug approvals in the wet AMD side this year or in the past you know, year or two, um, yeah. such as... Oh, and Ilya, could you kind of go over those a little bit and how they differ from the original standard of care? Yeah, so we've been also fortunate in wet macular degeneration um, and having more options. You know, we traditionally had 
you know, at first just one medication, and then we had two medications for another five years, and, and then we only had three medications for the better part of maybe 15 years. So, you know, to have two new medications in relatively a, you know, one to two year span is, is a huge difference for us. And, um, you know, it's just more tools in your tool belt. The, the difference between these two medications um, is that they are expected to do the same, having the same benefits, meaning um, treating the wet macular degeneration um, just as successfully as the other medications, but potentially with less frequency. So um, medications in the eye for these injections that I've been alluding to, again, these are treatment for wet macular degeneration because we don't have a cure for it. So when the medication wears off, you need to get your medication again. And so for some of the earlier medications we used, these injections would unfortunately wear off um, after four to maybe six weeks. These newer medications um, are have been clinically uh, proven in, in clinical trials to last longer. So that can decrease the just the burden for the patient and, you know, having family members to come in every single month. There's a lot to having these appointments um, monthly, and um, these these newer medications have a potential for uh, being used less frequent, frequently. Now, I, I kind of emphasize a potential because um, not everybody's wet macular degeneration is exactly the same, and, and clinical trial patients are, are definitely different than um, somebody who's been treated with wet macular degeneration for 15 years. And so it's definitely a good dialogue, again, with your treating physician of, hey, there's these medications. Do you think these medications are a benefit for me? Why or why not? Or what do you think that they could do for me? Or potentially why don't, you know, why they may not be helpful for me? Along those lines, um, you mentioned patients who have been in treatment for a long time. We just got a question as you were talking um, about, well, the question is, will wet AMD get worse the longer you have it, even if you get the injections? So our primary goal, and we are fairly successful in achieving that goal, is maintenance. So it's very difficult with wet macular degeneration to get improvement, but we are rather successful uh, to create stability and to create ma maintenance in that the wet macular degeneration should not continue to get worse um, long term. Thank you. Um, we always get a lot of questions about red light therapy or photobiomodulation, um, and I know there is a slight difference in what's going on in Europe and here. Could you talk a little bit about that or if it is something that's being considered for use in the United States? Um, so there is a U.S.-based clinical trial looking at the, the red light um, therapy, and, and the, the goal of what um, the red light therapy is is to try to decrease the rate of progression of the intermediate AMD to um, geographic atrophy. So, um, the in the UK they were able to find that um, patients had a, a lower rate of geographic atrophy in the eyes that were treated, but it was it's still very very early in in both clinical trial and in clinical practice. Um, and then in the U.S., it's been a fairly uh, limited um, clinical trial that was looking at uh, using using this. But right now, um, it is sort of it is sort of promising in um, uh, decreasing the rate of geographic atrophy progression. Well, we will definitely continue to keep tabs on that. Um, and my final questions are sort of um, in a similar vein. <clears throat> um, I'd, I'd like to discuss any promising new treatments um, that might be in clinical trials on the horizon. I know we get a lot of questions about stem cell. Um, people are, of course, very hopeful for that as a way to reverse AMD, and I know we're not quite there yet. And then we had a couple questions about um, genetic um, gene variants, targeted treatment, um, blood markers, that sort of thing. But generally, could you talk about what you're hopeful for um, that's on the horizon treatment-wise? Um, yeah. So I, to me, I think that that question can be answered sort of what I'm hoping for in the next few years, 
the next, you know, like decade, that kind of thing. Like, I feel like there's a different answer for different time courses. Um, I think that our treatment for wet macular degeneration has tra changed dramatically just over the past couple of years, like we just talked about. So I look forward to still just better medications, medications that can last longer in a patient's eye so that um, they, they're not so debilitated by their treatment um, burden. Um, so that, I think, is going to continue to get better in a shorter period of time, just have better medications that last longer. Um, longer term, uh, things like stem cell treatment, um, clearly that would be revolutionary for us as retina specialists to be able to actually regenerate um, damaged cells. I, I think that that is always something that is being researched um, but we're still quite a ways away from that being a, a reasonable treatment anytime soon. But um, we're always just as excited whenever there's any any case case reports or any sort of positive news in that direction. Um, and then the other things that are always being um, researched are oral medications, right? So especially. Um, for geographic atrophy, if there's any oral medications that patients can take versus coming in to get an injection in the eye, which, you know, um, for for lots of different reasons is is a lot for um, the patient. So I think oral medications, better medications, other ways of delivering the medication. So we've had some progress in like a surgical implant to treat um, to provide a, a constant flow of medication. So I think those are the more, you know, more more things that we could expect over the next five, 10 years. Um, longer term, further down the road, you know, things that we can hope will continue to develop would be things like stem cell treatment. Great. Um, so we're kind of coming on the end of our time together. I'm going to go through um, our kind of our closing comments, and then I'll give you a chance at the end um, to prepare any closing thoughts or things I might have missed. Um, so in the meantime, um, to our listeners, I sincerely hope you found today's chat helpful. Our next Bright Focus Macular Chat will be on Wednesday, March 27th, and the topic is what you need to know about cataracts and macular degeneration. Um, with that, Dr. Riley, do you have any closing thoughts or recommendations you'd like to share with, with our audience today? No, I think the questions were terrific. They they really show a, a good understanding of macular degeneration, and I just hope that um, as as patients, they that everybody continues to ask these questions to their treating doctors because I think uh, communication is so, so important. Very, very, very true. Um, well, it was wonderful to have you back today. You've been um, a faithful <laughs> chat speaker for us over many years, and it's wonderful to hear your voice again. Um, thank you very much. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us today. And this concludes the Bright Focus Macular Chat. Thank you. The information provided in this recording is a public service of Bright Focus Foundation and is not intended to constitute medical advice. Please consult your physician for personalized medical, dietary, and or exercise advice. Any medications or supplements should only be taken under medical supervision. Bright Focus Foundation does not endorse any medical products or therapies.